Good afternoon, and welcome to this year's Holberg Lecture, which will be delivered by the 2019 Holberg Laureate, Professor Paul Gilroy. Paul Gilroy is Professor of American and English Literature at King's College London. In 1986, he received his PhD in Cultural Studies from the University of Birmingham under the supervision of Stuart Hall and Richard Johnson. He has held positions at, among other institutions, the University of Essex, Goldsmiths College, Yale University, and London School of Economics. As of August 2019, he will be founder director, founding director and professor of humanities at the Center for Studies on Race and Racism at UCL, or University College London. Paul Gilroy is a fellow of the British Academy, the Royal Society of Literature, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He also holds honorary doctorates from Goldsmiths College and the Universities of Liege and Sussex. Professor Gilroy's scholarship is truly interdisciplinary. And to quote the Holbeck Committee's assessment, his work has, quote, influenced and in some cases reshaped several fields and subfields, including cultural studies, critical race studies, sociology, history, anthropology, and African American studies, end quote. Paul Gilroy has also made substantial contributions to Black Atlantic and diasporic studies, as well as post-colonial studies. Through the seminal works, There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack from 1987, The Black Atlantic, Modernity and Double Consciousness from 1993, Against Race from 2000, and Darker Than Blue on the Moral Economies of Black Atlantic Cultures, from 2010, Paul Gilroy has developed, has delivered groundbreaking work that has challenged conventional understanding of modernity. In Gilroy's historical account, he considers the development of Western civilization, or sorry, Western modernity, be it economic, political, or cultural, to be largely based on the trade movement of slaves and goods across the Atlantic between Europe Africa and the Americas. Gilroy views the displaced and enslaved Africans not merely as victims of brutal exploitation by European colonialism, but also as vital agents in the construction of modernity. Displaced black people have, through a complex web of diasporic relations evolving through more than four centuries, contributed to the creation of vibrant, hybrid cultures on both sides of the Atlantic. His scholarship offers an incisive challenge to mainstream notions of race, nation, and ethnicity, which have traditionally been conceived in terms of fixed and exclusionary categories. Instead, Gilroy has convincingly argued for the fluid and hybrid nature of culturally constructed identities, which are constantly remolded and changing through the mere proximity and interactions between racially and culturally diverse groups. In his work, Professor Gilroy has continuously challenged received notions of race and racial hierarchies and has been the, an unspoke, outspoken public intellectual on matters concerning racism, all the while exploring a politics of moving beyond race. In post-colonial melancholia from 2005, as well as in the tenor lectures from 2014, Gilroy has projected an affirmative vision of convivial cosmopolitanism and reparative humanism. And through his prolonged engagement with black aesthetics, be it music, film, or art, Paul Gilroy has contributed to the production and astute analysis of black culture. He continues to argue for the vital role of aesthetic expressions in our common efforts to transform societies on this planet into livable spaces where all, humani all of humanity may thrive. The title of Profes Professor Gilroy's Holberg Lecture is Never Again, Refusing Race 
and salvaging the human. Paul Gilroy, the floor is yours. It's a great honor and a, a privilege, a humbling thing to uh, be asked to uh, address you this afternoon as the Holberg Laureate. I would like to repeat the thanks that have already been made and my personal appreciation for all those who have worked so hard to make these events of the last few days such a joy in which to participate, to thank the Holberg Prize Committee, to thank the University of Bergen, and of course, to thank the Norwegian people for this extraordinarily generous um, life-changing um, development. It's commonplace to observe that democracy in Europe has reached a kind of point of danger, a moment of danger. As alien capitalism emancipates itself from democratic regulation, ultranationalism and populism, xenophobia and varieties of neo-fascism have become more visible, more assertive, more corrosive of our political culture. The widespread appeal of racialized group identity and racism, often conveyed obliquely with a knowing wink, has been instrumental in delivering us to a situation in which our dearest conceptions of truth, of law, of government, have been placed in jeopardy. In many places, the pathological hunger for national rebirth and the restoration of an earlier political time has combined with resentful, authoritarian, and belligerent responses to alterity and to the expectation of hospitality. Those reactions underscore the timeliness and the importance of analyzing racism and nationalism and xenology, which are nowadays so frequently disseminated online. Intensified by evasive and dubious techno-political forces, they've begun to correspond to the anxieties of lived experience in pre precarious and austere conditions. The effects of that shift are augmented by the uptake of generic conceptions of racial identity sourced from the United States. They've gained significant international currency even even in places barely touched by the signature racial habits of the North Atlantic, which would project the world only in black and white. More than a century ago, W.B. Du Bois, whose exceptionally wide-ranging work provided one axis of our discussion earlier on today, he traced the emergence of what he called personal whiteness. The resulting hierarchy became widely influential, and lately it has, in its residual condition, been well served by the malign vectors of social and timeline media. The attractiveness of generic racial identities is part of a psychopolitical shift that has encouraged fascination with ossified culture, lacking vitality but easily regulated. The invocations to whiteness now circulating in Europe are freighted with notions of victimage and vulnerability. They become compelling in the face of the existential threats presented on the one hand by the Trojan horse of immigrant fertility and on the other by the encroachment of alien influences from the global south into the fortified yet somehow perennially fragile heartlands of overdevelopment. Vivid images of invasion and demographic warfare have enhanced the allure of the rebranded fascism that styles itself now the alt-right. It's, it's an unlikely and uneasy alliance of trolls and misogynists, meninists, ethno-nationalists, xenophobes, accelerationists, all dedicated to resisting the looming existential catastrophe that they like to describe as the great replacement. Rather than confront that rising movement, the political and academic mainstream has often sought in vain to steal its clothes in a doomed competition that can enhance neither democracy nor knowledge. 
Long-established patterns of civility, like those which marked the boundaries of acceptable political speech, have been altered for the worse. And the effects of this new effective ecology are amplified by the predictive capabilities of surveillance capitalism and the technological security complex with which it is allied. So far, the weaponization of culture and information has been much more successfully exploited by the neo-fascists than by their disoriented opponents. I want to insist that this notable deterioration in our political culture and institutions can't be understood without paying the most careful attention to the specific dynamics, both of race as a matter of political ontology and of racism as a variety of political speech. Race and nation are now primary sources of groupness and absolute ethnicity. They're supposedly endowed with a special power, the power to restore certainty, to discover stability amidst the flux of precarious life in increasingly perilous conditions. In the 20th century, militarist appeals to racial hygiene and ethno-national unanimity resulted in genocide. That history of warfare and mass death is something it should be inexcusable not to know. However, as those epoch-making events pass from living memory, familiarity with them has become patchy and intermittent. The archive of ineffable horror drifts into an indeterminate space where information is untrusted. News can be faked and spun, and truth held hostage, not by the politics of knowledge, but by the political machinery that assembles a carefully managed ignorance, a curated ignorance. From the mid-century, as we know so well, artists and thinkers, jurists, psychologists and philosophers labored to make the unprecedented slaughter of those times accepted as part of the official conscience of an increasingly networked world. However, the difficult, belated acts of recognition and acceptance that they won were not the end they imagined they would be. Keeping attention focused on the charnel houses in Europe and beyond it has required a continuous commemorative intervention and renewal, which has also provided another spur for resentment. Those horrors, <coughs> excuse me, those horrors are always much closer to us than we like to imagine. And preventing their recurrence requires keeping them in mind. Monitoring our motivation for undertaking that thankless work is also essential. And as Raymond Williams suggested, we cement our dissenting tradition by selecting the ancestors that we need. Du Bois was a Germanophile before he went to live and study in that country. He visited Poland on three occasions and was clear about exactly what he had learned about the world's race problems by placing colonial rule, the Third Reich, and the racial order of the United States in historical, moral, and conceptual relation. One result of that effort, born in particular from his own attempt to bear witness to the fate of the Warsaw Ghetto, was, <clears throat> uh, was, as he says, not so much a clearer understanding of the Jewish problem as it was a real and more complete understanding of the Negro problem, unquote. Primo Levi, an authoritative humanistic emissary from the gray zone of the Auschwitz lager, warned his readers about the continuing dangers posed by fascism and by its imitators. In 1974, he issued a famous warning to which I've regularly returned for guidance in recent years. Let me quote him. Every age has its own fascism. And we see the warning signs wherever the concentration of power denies citizens the possibility and the means of expressing and acting on their own free will. There are many ways of reaching this point, and not just through the terror of police intimidation, but by denying and distorting information, by undermining systems of justice, 
by paralyzing the education system and by spreading in myriad subtle ways nostalgia for a world where order reigned, where the security of a privileged few depends on the forced labor and the forced silence of the many." Unquote. I would like Tony Morrison to be a third ancestral harbinger this afternoon. She has, incidentally, expressed her strong affinity with what she called Levy's defiant humanism and applauded his, quote, deliberate and sustained glorification of the human in opposition to the efforts of systematic necrology. Morrison, too, penned a warning about the steady resurgence of fascism in the years immediately. She wrote this immediately after the publication of Beloved. Umberto Eco, another thoughtful anatomist of the fascist period, which he had witnessed from the precious perspective of a bewildered child, extended some of Levy's insights and drew the obvious political conclusions in another enduringly valuable intervention, from which I will quote. Ur-fascism is still around us, sometimes in plain clothes. It would be much easier for us if there appeared on the world scene somebody saying, I want to reopen Auschwitz. I want the black shirts to parade again in the Italian squares. Life is not that simple, he continues. Ur-fascism can come back under the most innocent of disguises. And our duty is to uncover it and to point out, finger at it, any of its new instances, every day and in every part of the world." Unquote. These wise comments converge, I think, on an understanding of fascism as a recurrent and infinitely translatable phenomenon. And that approach doesn't consider it to be endowed with an essence. If it has to have one, though, I would submit that the prescient words of Jean Améry, another survivor, who was able to describe its claws and its teeth with greater precision than many, might usefully now be borne in mind. Repeated readings of Améry's At the Mind's Limits, his disturbing study of the predicament of intellectuals in the concentration camp, have guided my own intellectual work for many years. He interprets his own experience those of you who are unfamiliar with this, uh, do seek it out. He interprets his own experience of being tortured. He explores it forensically with the phenomenological tools he had acquired as a student of philosophy in Vienna. Two aspects of his argument seem especially relevant this afternoon. The first is that he felt the work of Franz Fanon spoke for him uniquely in grasping the philosophical and political meanings of what he had endured in the concentrationary universe and its supply chains. The second is that he, again like Fanon, responded to those trials by becoming a combative proponent of what he called a radical humanism. Amari discovered his juridical and his ontological Jewishness as a result of Nazi violence and he was delivered to a deeper understanding of its historical and philosophical significance as a result of being tortured under the outspread wings of that bird of prey he called the Gestapo. In those talons, he tells us, he acquired a stake in the politics of dignity, which could answer the governmental actions that had brought racial hierarchy so disastrously, yet legally, to life. Aggressive commitments to race had shattered the flimsy social conventions of his civilized intercultural childhood and then hung him up from a ceiling hook by his dislocated arms in the dimly lit business room of the Brindonk Fortress in Belgium. Quote, everyone went about his business and theirs was murder, unquote. The resulting injuries conditioned Amari's passionate 1945 support for the State of Israel, which he saw as a national liberation project. And that outlook was intertwined both with his politics of personal authenticity and with his endorsements of Fanon's view that counterviolence could acquire a reparative, even a, a healing effect for individuals who had themselves been subjected to systematic brutality. 
And Marie was motivated not just to explain the indelible effects of brutalization on his own political, psychological, and moral dispositions, but to substantiate what he understood to be the difficult and contentious claim that torture was not an accidental quality of this Third Reich, and I'm quoting him again, but its essence, its essence. Today, that unsettling assertion directs critical analysis of our own securitocracy and its proliferating states of exception to an extremely uncomfortable judgment about the half-life of the 20th century fascist revolution. As you know, torture is prohibited. So is the use of any information it might produce. Exceptional circumstances cannot make its use legitimate. War and other public emergencies do not provide justification. And yet, many governments, not least my own, have been contorting themselves in order to be able to torture their foes without being seen to have done so. Amiri's perspective would interpret the resulting double standard as evidence of the resilience and mutability of fascism. Perhaps with additional guidance from Fanon, he would have also been able to see it as the living residue of race-friendly colonial rule. Restored to the metropole, those habits have incubated a new political rhetoric and a distinctive governmental idiom that delights in employing euphemisms, such as waterboarding, stress positions. And like the repertoire of cruelty that these terms obfuscate, this new speak has proved to be as infinitely translatable as the 20th century science of public relations from which it derives. In this context, applying the seductive language of advertising demands additional analysis. It reassures all who dwell so complacently within the bubble of official politics that they're correct in believing that they can make anything mean whatever they want it to mean. War can be peace, ignorance is certainly strength, even if freedom is not quite yet slavery. The corrosive products of the 20th century's fascist revolution are not only discernible in these governmental misconduct, uh, they arrive now from a number of different and additional directions. They emerge from the unprecedented corporate mystification and orchestration of information, from the effects of ever more tightly associated police and military activities. They unfurl from the violence common to the mainstreamed ultra-right and its fringe of violent lone wolves that radicalized in the insomniac virtual world perpetrate spectacular mass murder on a freelance basis in the actual world. Refining analytical concepts addressed to the problems that these overlapping phenomena exemplify will help us, I think, today to know where our democracy is coming apart and what its successors are likely to be. Those speculative efforts will benefit from an extensive and uh, a deep historical literacy. They must be guided by a bold commitment to the future which can make that negative clarion call never again into a positive prescription that places us in contact with the world we desire and strive against the odds to build. Influential commentary on recent manifestations of the fascist resurgence has hindered that utopian possibility. By speaking in vague and nonspecific terms about the dangers of populism. More serious and more specific considerations of racism may persuade them that resorting to that label risks mystifying or even obscuring the alarming situation that is unfolding now, that fearful images of alien invasion in Europe have been merged with ideas of civilizational clash, white cultural vulnerability, and demographic decline. In these perilous circumstances, then, reaching for the abstractions of high theory can compound the way that official political communication has been char become characterized by what Stuart Hall years ago identified as an inferential racism. Inferential, by inference. Those tactics seek to instrumentalize knowing in coded appeals to racial fears, anxieties, and advantages while simultaneously creating opportunities to disavow or deny the racial meanings that are being dog-whistled and targeted with increased algorithmic precision. 
If this wicked strategy is challenged, its perpetrators can profess a pretended ignorance of how these elements of racist and ultranationalist uh, uh, ultranationalist uh, uh, discourse have functioned in the past. And if that denial sounds implausible, they will hide behind the general problem of free speech, which is inflated now so as to obscure any other juridical or ethical consideration. Those of us committed to the multidisciplinary study of culture as a primary object of our research, as well as a methodological key to analyses of the interplay of power and language and performance and context, can contribute, I think, to interpretation of the nascent forms of this psychopolitics. Our attachment to culture points away from the autonomy of race as a category and towards its sedimentation, its embeddedness in evolving historical and material conditions. In other words, it underscores the irreducible specificity of cultural life and communication. Culture is articulated with economic and political structures and flows, but they do not determine it. Historical approaches to cultural matters can foster a distinctive epistemological orientation. Racial difference is not produced by nature, yielding variations that can be misrecognized and thereby transformed into the rational substance of racial hierarchy. Instead, races are assembled, conjured into being by the usually violent workings of racism. Thus, races are summoned. Thus, they are animated as political and economic actors. Struggling with these problems has shaped my thinking since I began to publish. They orbit the issue of common sense nationalism, particularly where it meshes with, meshes with racism and xenology, and they have intensified my desire to respond to the certainties and the moorings provided by racial sentiment by locating, by promoting other kinds of ontological ballast. They can be found in forms of identification that, in opposition to reified identity, emerge from affinity and from convivial contact, from place, from generation, from sexualities, and from gender. And with those possibilities in mind, I want to propose that we are better equipped to turn firmly away from the defaulted racial ordering of life. Historically, that gesture has been associated with the elaboration of new ways of understanding humanity, and thus with new varieties of humanism. Their novelty is confirmed by that dogged refusal of the world rendered definitively in racialized shapes. To be sure, this is a difficult response, but it's not one that needs to rely either upon cultivating colorblindness or in practicing word avoidance, as its critics have sometimes charged. Instead, it follows Fanon and others in arguing that an intrinsic eye for racial difference should never be assumed or asserted as a defining feature of our species' hardwiring. Comparative historical and cultural analysis reveals that those sensitivities are the outcome of iteration and education, which generate the habitual patterns Fanon presented as the workings of the racial corporeal schemata. Another way to grasp this pivotal point might be found by returning to those famous opening sentences of Du Bois' 1903, The Souls of Black Folk, the book that made him a political leader of African Americans. And later, of course, of the world's rebellious colonial peoples. He excavates there a key question that he sees as implicit in a host of other routine, conversational interactions which exemplify the limits of liberal reaction to the apparently incorrigible substance of racial division. That question is, how does it feel to be a problem? It's an absurd, it's an insulting inquiry. Yet it was present, though unspoken and unspeakable, in a host of other well-meaning responses to the badge of inferiority that the sage of Great Barrington wore as a result of being misrecognized as a Negro. That latent question spoke directly to the predicament of the doubly conscious modern black subject, whose blackness was antagonistically disposed against the possibility and the value of democratic citizenship. Du Bois imagined that escaping onto political emplacement as a Negro would yield the possibility of a dialectical resolution 
of the racial strife that became visible along the fracture between a postponed recognition as human and the deferred award of political rights. The warring plural selves inside the racialized subject could then be sublated into this richer, more substantial conception of national citizenship, reformed and undistorted after the retreat of hierarchy and segregation. The issue of exclusion from national citizenship and political rights does remain with us and rightly claims much of the energy of anti-racist movements. However, as my work has evolved, I've become increasingly preoccupied with the other face of that transformation that Du Bois aspired to. And this is the belated, the shocking acquisition, not of rights, but of common humanity. This risky business necessitates more than merely an end to the distorted recursions of racial misrecognition and a substitution of brighter-hued universalism for quieter, more sober, more blood-stained varieties. This will be an epochal change. It involves a qualitative and imaginative transformation that fails if it is undertaken only to vindicate the veiled humanity of the racially inferior. This bold gambit includes potential gains, both for the victims of the racial order and for its beneficiaries, who acquire a precious chance chance to salve and repair what Fanon described as their amputated human being. Contrary to some influential contemporary approaches, the unjust and the cruel arrangements that prompt this rebellion are not eternal structures. Du Bois' color line was a contingent historical arrangement, substantial, yes, but never invulnerable. And such systems are more usefully considered historically than they are metaphysically. My resolute commitment to their undoing is premised on an appreciation of their constitutive power, a stance that confirms my status as a bit of a dissenter in this narcissistic age. I think we should be skeptical about the seductions of the ontological turn recently promoted in the study of race politics. It has become disastrously complicated by a prospective nostalgia for the easy, essentialist approaches that were once dominant when assertive cultural nationalism ruled the roost. I think we can rebuild an alternative by taking cues from what we might call the agonistic humanisms of the black Atlantic thinkers who capitalized on Du Bois' imaginative breakthrough. Readings of the work of, of Cooper, of Senghor, of Hurston, James, Fanon, Césaire, Winter, and all the others can be combined with the fruits of some long-forgotten versions of black feminism with which those endeavors had been entangled. We are drawn to the realization that it is imperative to remain less interested in who or what we imagine ourselves to be than in what we can do for one another, both in today's emergency conditions and in the grimmer circumstances that so surely await us. So, in opposition to the rarefied habits of high theory, I propose a lowlier orientation. It corresponds, I think, to what we can learn about the primal responsibility we bear towards others by observing humane, selfless, and generous responses to the elemental perils that we know, perils like flood and drought and pollution, as well as acute, deadly emergencies, risky activities like sea travel undertaken by fugitives and refugees. The latter example is particularly important to me. Clear moral and juridical choices are involved in salvaging people from the water, as they are in the tasks of naming the drowned and promoting the dignity that they lose when, or we can recover by burying their bodies. In many circumstances, we are referred to the forms of care and sociality conditioned by disaster and what we might call the banality, not of evil, but of good. They operate on smaller scales than the revolutionary opportunities we associate with disaster capitalism. These responses are closer to the ordinary virtue that might be glimpsed in disaster altruism or disaster solidarity. This lowly thinking operates optimally at the changing level where the sea and the land meet, and this has another advantage. It stimulates concern with planetarity, and it can foster the worldly outlook that is required if anti-racism is to be more than a parochial concern. The activity that results can be understood best not as an exercise in self-exploration 
or self-care conducted on the primrose path towards diversity, always understood only as enhanced visibility, but when it is conceived as a deepening of democracy, a transformational practice that points beyond unsustainable arrangements towards better ones, from which in turn some richer conceptions of the human, untrammeled by racial styles of thought, may already have started to emerge. The humanizing possibilities of that conviviality and that care are not, of course, limited to maritime settings, but they seem somehow easier to appreciate in what Derek Walcott called <coughs> the sea's gray vault. Similar responses have appeared in a host of other emergency situations. For me, most vividly, in the aftermath of the murderous fire in London's Grenfell Tower, now almost two years ago, two years ago uh, next week, which displayed a number of comparable patterns. In that instance, the survivors' emphasis on the human dimensions of their vulnerability to the flames was both telling and consistent. Stories of sympathy, stories of solidarity were circulated against the effects of slow violence and official indifference. The language of humanity is central to the survivors' descriptions of their own trauma and in the terms of the appeal that they made to the world, not, not to raise money but in pursuit of attention, or as they put it, seeking clarity rather than charity. To me, these humbling and inspiring reactions suggest that trumpeting our abandonment of humanism, spurning the strategic challenges of minor universalism, these are redundant gestures, and rehearsing them takes us further away from the mentality we need to cultivate in order to respond to the emergencies that are waiting. The Black Atlantic traditions I've described were conditioned by the work of vindicating black humanity, but they were never reducible to that task alone, and they've been enriched by exposure to cosmologies that do not consider individuality or subject formation, agency, or temporality, property or groupness in exclusively European terms. The resulting mix of resources furnishes us with a compass that we can use to locate some newer and better understandings of the human considered post-anthropologically, that is, after the death of man. Du Bois helps again here. He approached the history of slavery systematically as an unfolding of Atlantic modernity presented in watery terms. He triangulates the establishment of the modern racial order that counterposed the human to the Negro in an artful interrelation of ship and sea and land. In harmony with Shakespeare, who did not, according to Du Bois, wince when a Negro sat beside him, a new kind of humanism come, came into being through the destruction of the historic racial constellation that emanated from the topos of terror that he names the death ship. Three streams of thinking, he tells us, have flowed down to our day from that filthy hull. Each of them, the dialectician tells us, contained a thought and an afterthought. So he arranges the resulting pairs in a dialectical pattern, and in doing so, used a transformative, anti-racist humanism to inaugurate a distinctive political tradition. And those ways of thinking about humanity, modernity, ethics, freedom, and knowledge are still present, but they are so often scorned. They're dismissed as sentimental uh, uh, or unsophisticated. They come under attack from various trans, post, and anti-humanisms. And in scholastic settings, a distaste for history seems to compound that problem, and it increases with the appetite for sophistry. The resulting combination feeds a reluctance to approach the central issues of anti-racist ambition and anti-racist hope. Instead, we encounter a sort of simplistic yet tenacious attachment to the idea that the most sophisticated thing we can say in thinking about humanism and its ambiguities, sees them not as symptoms, but as the fundamental cause of all the racism in the world. Considered against that framework derived from Du Bois' path-breaking interventions, that response looks rather provincial. A paranoid, a parochial hostility to humanism, and indeed to humanity, resonates most loudly behind fortified campus walls where the hip imperatives of identity politics, that is a docile nihilism, a resignation, and a complacent ethnic absolutism, all reign unchallenged 
while the seductions of the alt-right, to which they are a kind of kin, present a growing danger. If the trajectory that Du Bois formalized has to have an origin, I would suggest we might discover it provocatively in Equiano's narrative. Autobiography or fiction, it makes no difference. This option requires, though, giving up the conventional sense of the venerable African seafarer as an American, positioned at the head of a tradition of imaginative and autobiographical abolitionist writing. Equiano's restless oceanic peregrinations supply a better key to what we need to do now. And they include, if you recall, the instructive discovery of the plight of the Genoese gallery, galley slaves, which precipitates for him his comparative assessments of the different varieties of slavery and cruelty he witnessed. Think, if you will, of the neglected passage in the book, where, imperiled by storms off the Bahamas, though still a slave, Equiano takes command of his endangered ship, He's galvanized to intervene because the number of other enslaved but expendable Africans remain chained below the decks of the vessel. Facing shipwreck and imminent death, Equiano's white fellow sailors have become inert, apparently indifferent to their own fate. They begin drinking grog, imagine, and they lie around the vessels, he tells us, like swine while he, endowed with this hopeful, divinely instituted energy, takes on the superhuman task of saving everybody on board. And he's joined in that demanding work by three black men and a Dutch Creole sailor, unquote. They work so hard to save the foundering boat that the skin is stripped from his hands. Equiano's predicament in that maritime emergency was particular and instructive. He's bound by faith, by law, and what we might now call a humanitarian ethic to the fate of the fellow Africans lodged in the hold, while also being obliged faithfully to discharge his responsibilities as a trusted crewman on the vessel. And from that dilemma, with its echoes of the then recent Zong case and the contested commercial value and legal status of the slave life, he sees the opportunity to save everyone, not only in the name of God, but also in the name of humanity yet to come. Equiano reports that he emerges from that thalassic trial, recognizable despite his slave status as a kind of chieftain among his fellow crewmen. And the ordeal invests him with a new authority, superior both to the conventional ranking established among seafarers and the stricter violent hierarchies of racialized life found routinely on the segregated order of the shore. His conduct exemplifies the generosity and the empathy demanded alike by the pursuit of a new humanism and the elaboration of what we might call a hydrophanic ethic in which meaning is revealed through the mediating agency or presence of water. This maritime archive can help, I think, to tune us precisely to the demands resulting from the contemporary attempts to divine and apply a different humanist ethos. One that is not congruent with a racial nomos, and has been conditioned by emergency conditions, has been shaped by emergency conditions, in particular by proximity to water and the obligations to confront its specific and special perils when the fate of other human beings demands it. The value of this response increases when it combines with an enhanced power of the difficulties involved in exercising judgment and power, as well as concern with the destabilizing interrelation and interdependency of varying forms of life, human, infrahuman, and non-human. The movable boundaries between these categories are central to the bloody operations of racial hierarchy in the 18th century, in the 19th century, and they remain so today. The Earth's colonial nomos was theorized and mapped historically, geopolitically in the 20th century by the influential Nazi jurist Carl Schmitt. His small book on land and sea still supplies some insights into the mutual association of hydrarchy and planetarity. It was also, it's in, interestingly, uh, Schmidt includes the provocative observation that Herman Melville was to the world of oceans what Homer had been to the Eastern Mediterranean, unquote. Delivered exactly from the period when whale oil I know this is a matter of local interest, 
began to, be, uh, began to supersede fossil fuel, sorry, when whale oil began to be superseded by fossil fuel in the branded form of kerosene. Melville's Moby Dick and its passionate planetary survey of errant humanity, the life of mar marine species, weather, capital, and objects encompassed a number of arguments about the character and moral integrity of modern racial orders and the elemental significance of racial hierarchy as a repudiation of the claims of humanism, religious or profane. And we begin to comprehend what m might have made Melville's work so influential among the rising constituency of mid-20th century black Atlantic radicals. Uh, uh, he showed them what the racial nomos was implicated in the doom of Atlantic, that is, Western humankind, and he points the way by being prepared to have Captain Ahab speculate so pointedly about the commercial value of the slave boy, Pip, calculated against the value of the whale. I haven't got time to read that quote, unfortunately, but I'm sure you can find it. Melville presents slavery uh, as pelagic and planetary, its true character could be revealed in the peculiar theater of power found at sea. It was an obscure gray confrontation between the properly human and the supposedly infrahuman, between the white and the black. If you recall the mutinied slaves in the novella Benita Serino, who enact the perplexing choreography of their submission while actually being in command of their floundering journey to freedom, they were misrecognized in that mist, in that gray mist, as a result, they get over-identified with the happy, musical, clownish baboon, the Negro. The Negro who is taken to not philanthropically, but genially, like a Newfoundland dog, or becomes, as Melville uh, it might be uh, re-spoken by fun on an object among other objects, although in Melville these are different objects. They're combs and brushes and castanets in uh, Benito Serena. But there's something about the maritime staging of those encounters between human, animal, and object that presents the core dynamics of the rapacious system of slavery with great clarity. And we can pursue these lines of argument just a bit further under the guidance of another black Atlantic polymath, someone I was very fortunate to meet in my uh, um, early years of my um, uh, career, the Trinidadian C.L.R. James who, detained on Ellis Island as an illegal alien by the McCarthy-era U.S. immigration authorities, uh, wrote a book-length study of the writings of Melville as a petition to the United States government seeking admission. It took the form, of, as I say, of this study of Melville's writings. And that book, Mariners, Renegades, and Castaways, helped me, I think, to appreciate that Melville had been born within a few months of both Karl Marx and Frederick Douglass. These radical anatomists of the pathology and misery of industrial capitalist exploitation, that heavily bearded trio shared a number of common concerns. James' plea to the US government demonstrated how Melville's literary output might be read for the way it complemented the political efforts and epistemologies of Marx and Douglass by extending their inquiries into some deeper water Douglas had published The Heroic Slave, his only work of fiction, in 1853, a couple of years before the appearance of Benito Serino. But Douglas's novel includes a shipboard mutiny by slaves on an appropriately named ship, the Creole. And his story was based on real events that, um, sorry to be, I know it's bad to be what they call geeky, but the thing is that the events described in, um, in Douglas's novella actually involved um, details, historical details drawn from the um, activities, the commercial and maritime activities of Melville's extended family. So I think that's a, another point in the background. And it's not really that surprising that the work could be read in relation because these two men, Melville and Douglas, lived in the same location on three different occasions and they may well have met. Some of the biographical um, studies suggest they may have met. Anyway, there's a complicated intertextual sequence that connects them, and it can be supplemented to encompass the work of later writers. Writers who use their ideas to divine a moral and political course that was repeatedly illuminated by watery examples. Ralph Ellison's already been mentioned today, and of course his connection to Melville was revealed by his employing the concluding words of Benito Serino as the epigraph to Invisible Man. 
He acknowledged his debt to writers like Melville, for whom, quote, the Negro symbolized both the man lowest down and the mysterious underground aspect of the human personality. In a sense, continues Allison, the Negro was the gauge of the human condition as it waxed and waned in our democracy, unquote. That image of the Negro as a gauge or canary in the coal mine of Western civilization was taken a good deal further by others. Richard Wright, for example, had been reading Moby Dick while writing Native Son, and he lists Melville's book among his favorites. He drew political conclusions at variance with Ellison's, of course, although the maritime metaphors continued. And similar ideas and images can be found in the work of later writers. For example, of James Baldwin, uh, whose essay, Nothing Personal, reads today like a luminous repudiation of every idiocy of identity politics. Baldwin concludes with these lines, quote, the sea rises, the light fails. Lovers cling to each other and the children cling to us. The moment we cease to hold each other, the moment we break faith with one another, the sea engulfs us and the light goes out. The composite of human frailty and interdependency that becomes visible in the frame of maritime peril is striking again. And in order to divine its contemporary significance, I think we can turn for assistance to Hans Blumenberg, whose essay, Shipwreck with Spectator, outlines the fundamental significance of the nautical metaphorics of existence in European cultural history. Of course, Blumenberg is not remotely concerned with either race or racism. But I would still submit that his angles of vision might be amended to address the meaning of these signs in the context of colonial and imperial hierarchy. Blumenberg presents the site of a shipwreck as the figure of an initial philosophical experience. And we get, I think, a hint of what that might mean when we think about how the 1781 case of the Zong provided some important source material for Turner's sublime 1840 painting exhibited in London in the Royal Academy at the same moment as the anti-slavery convention was meeting in Exeter Hall a few hundred meters away. An image which generates moral ballast for the indictment of racial capitalism at the anti-slavery convention that accompanied its first public display. As we struggle with the planetary and pelagic dimensions of our own emergency, we must acquire what, inquire into what that philosophical experience might now entail. First, we have to appreciate that the distinctive varieties of human recognition that are being sought and won in these watery spaces of death are not of the standard philosophical variety. They are defined in explicit opposition to the strictures of racism and ethnic absolutism. Second, we must accept that the d demands voiced by people resisting their consignment to infrahumanity infra do not boil down conveniently to existing understanding of group identity. They surpass the habits of mind that were derived from acknowledgement of individual selfhood under Europe, 18th century Europe's favored rules. Today, I think the demand for equal dignity operates as part of an appeal for recognition, not as culturally specific, but as vitally and mortally human. Those demands have been articulated precisely against the specifications and the effects of racial hierarchy. They arise in circumstances where the acknowledgement of humanity has either been withheld or is explicitly denied, where the passage towards inclusion in species life has been closed off. They are not, of course, directed towards the attainment of rights only. The bans, the double standards, the other exclusionary mechanism against which these demands have been voiced refer us to the contested limits of political communities that have been stratified according to the assumptions of nationalism and ab absolutist ethnic belonging, which are still conveyed as matters of race. Whether race is figured as natural history, as frozen culture, as political anatomy, institutionalized racism imagines and assembles it as an absolute, an unbridgeable division in social and political life. And this may be considered a vulgar point to raise in polite scholarly company, but I want to insist that racism has traveled, mutated, and grown from its enlightenment roots in the same intellectual compost 
that yielded the idea of essential human equality, which we should always remember provided no significant obstacles to the consolidation of European colonies and empires. The operations of that racial nomos are still uneven. There are significant regional and cultural variations in the intensity of attachment to race, in the intensity of attachment to the idea of whiteness, which of course has been falling in value, and to religious and to ethical commitments that might qualify or mediate those affects. Similarly, the degree of humanity identified in or awarded to racial, national, and ethnic inferiors fluctuates with politics and with economic life. The quality of sympathy, the quality of empathy that can be expressed once the veil of otherness has been torn to reveal unexpectedly a needy, vulnerable human countenance beneath is neither fixed nor overdetermined. Yes, racism and fascism have been rebranded by forces grown online, with the help of Russian troll farms, AI, bots that are programmed in one jurisdiction, registered in a second, deployed from a third. It bears repetition that the versions of identity politics in which they trade are built around the idea that Western civilization is being invaded and corrupted by alien intruders. And the political language of civil war is dominant, and the images, these images promote a distinctive conception of political time in which greatness can be restored after periods of weakness and lassitude, and nations once thought lost can be won back. They may be divided internally about the significance of gender relations, but the alt-right and its allies have projected a view of their own activities not as radically evil, but as intelligent, as daring, as transgressive, as comic, and as futuristic. Unlike their anti-racist opponents, these ironic authoritarians have been able to summon up seductive images of the utopia that guides their pragmatic and immediate political choices. They use the anodyne rhetoric of ethnostates and human biodiversity, but make no mistake, they want the world they are building to be racially pure and uniform. That new order will rest squarely upon revived natural relations between men and women, no longer distorted by feminism, and will be dictated to the preservation of the embattled West, which is threatened, as I said, by the fertility of non-white incomers and further menaced not only by the shadowy corporate forces of a cosmopolitan global elite, but in particular by the corruption introduced by Islam and the cultural Marxism of its treacherous supporters. Muslim has become fixed as a racial trope, rather like Jew in the interwar years of the 20th century. These unsavory forces intersect in and rely upon the political ontology of race. They oppose political correctness. They denounce multiculturalism. They employ the issue of free speech relentlessly to shift the limits of what can be said publicly. And the resulting movement expands not from the distribution of information, but as I said earlier, by the garnering and monopolization of attention. It will not be stopped by tactics used in the past to fight back against its predecessors. Of course, the nature of the ongoing emergency may mean that many people will prefer to renounce the their liberties in the name of security and the fantasy that the clock of political time can be turned back to a period when alterity just didn't arise. In response and in conclusion, I want to suggest that our responsibility to ourselves to the people in the water, now and in the future, must show how, against the effects of what Fanon called epidermalization, something like a real dialectic between the body and the world might be reasserted. Perhaps that has already begun, unanticipated to appear in the politics of sympathy discernible in the shadows of disaster. I hope that you will be prepared to join with or at least endorse the, that ongoing collective work of salvage. It is likely to involve more than just pulling imperiled fellow beings from the sea, for it is our own humanity that also needs to be rescued from the mounting wreckage. There is still time for that operation, but not much. Some years ago, musing on those very themes, the great poet and essayist June Jordan, someone else I was very privileged to know a little, suggested, and I'm quoting, the ultimate connection must be the need that we find between us. We can still learn from the challenging words that she spoke to and for her political generation. Let me quote her. 
It is not only who you are, but what we can do for each other that will determine the connection. I must make that connection real between me and these strangers before those clouds unify this ragged bunch of us. Too late. Tusam taka lesaman. Thank you so much to the audience, and thank you, Professor Gilroy, for your most moving lecture. There will be the opportunity to meet uh, Paul Gilroy in conversation with Finur Dalsen, who is also the, the laureate of the Nils Klim Prize, today at the House of Literature at 1800. I hope to see you there. Thank you.